Well, Nadir said he hopes that I'll prove him wrong. I aim to please. In my opening statements, I show that Christians are commanded over and over again, like a beating drum, to live in peace with everyone, to pursue peace, to love everyone, to be compassionate, to be merciful, to be gentle, to do good to everyone, to feed our enemies, to overcome evil with good, to put down our weapons. Christians are commanded not to return violence for violence or evil for evil. We're commanded not to hate. And Jesus said that his followers do not fight because his kingdom is not of this world. How did Nadir respond to these passages? Well, first he said the, the peaceful verses are cowardly because we have to fight people like Adolf Hitler. But it's important to understand the Christian context. We're talking about fighting in Jesus' name, fighting to establish our religion, fighting the unbelievers, as we saw yesterday, that Islam commands. You are not to fight unbelievers. God has established governments that can fight people like Adolf Hitler, but I'm not to go out and fight in Jesus' name those who reject him. Nadir decided to misrepresent the Bible in the various ways I already refuted in my opening statement. I said that Muslims misrepresent Christianity by distorting the teachings of Jesus and ripping verses out of context in order to make it sound as if Jesus calls for violence. John 18, 36, Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I, I would not be handed over to the Jews. The deer said, Well, Jesus is just saying in that context about being handed over to the Jews. It's not what he says. He says his kingdom's not of this world. That's why his followers aren't fighting. And the deer says, Well, that was just that one situation. Well, what better situation to fight for Jesus when the, Roman, <laughs> the Romans and the Jews are coming to take your Lord and Savior and nail him to a cross. What better time? That was the greatest time in all of history to fight for the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, don't do it. Nadir pointed out that uh, the quotation, those who take up the sword will die by the sword, can't be interpreted overly literally. I, uh, I agree. I think it's a general message to Christians. Christians, if you take this route, if you take this route of fighting and bloodshed, that's going to end with fighting and bloodshed, and he's absolutely correct. Nadir said that if you're commanded to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, well, what about Satan? He's your enemy. Well, read the context. It talks about we are supposed to love people as God loves them, and the example it gives is the sun rises, uh, God sends his son on the righteous and the unrighteous, the evil and the good, sends rain on these people as well. Uh, the point is, obviously, this is referring to other human beings, I'm talking about God sends his rain and sunshine, not on uh, the devil. So I'll tell you, I don't know the situation with Satan, but in context, is referring to human beings. Nadir quotes uh, 1927, which I already, I already pointed out the absurdity of this. Uh, he says, what if the parable ends at 26? Well, let's take that for a second. Uh, the parable ends at verse 26. And so Jesus would be saying to his followers in the next verse, but those enemies of mine who did not want to want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. What enemies? Those enemies of mine. What enemies? What enemies are you talking about? It has no context. In context, the enemies that were talked about in the passage were part of the parable. It's the king who went on the journey in the story, who then came back and saw that people had rebelled against him, and he said, bring those enemies here. It's a parable. If you rip that verse and try to say, all of a sudden, after finishing the story, Jesus says, those enemies of mine, bring them here and slay them before me. Well, one, that would totally contradict everything else Jesus says. Two, his followers certainly didn't interpret that way. They didn't run out and start slaughtering people. So why should we interpret it that way? Well, we shouldn't. This is simply a desperate attempt to make Christianity sound more like Islam. Matthew 10, 13, Nadir says, well, if, you, uh, if they reject the message, you let your peace return to you. What is this? This is your greeting. In fact, most Bible translation, translations translate this as your greeting of peace because it's your shalom, your greeting of peace. And the deer says, well, if you're taking back this peace, if you're taking back this greeting of peace, that shows that you're no longer being peaceful. Well, keep reading. What does he say? Then you leave. They don't accept the message. You leave. You shake the dust off your feet and what? it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the Day of Judgment. On the Day of Judgment, that's when people will be punished for rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing about you going and killing and slaughtering. Again, that would totally contradict everything Jesus teaches in the Gospels. 
I said that Muslims misrepresent Christianity by pretending that there's no difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Nadir quotes Romans chapter 13, saying that the Bible tells people, tells, uh, tells people that Nero is doing the will of God. Well, first of all, that, that's, that's totally false. He says governments are instituted by God. But how do we know that's not what Paul meant? Well, fundamental rule of scriptural interpretation, you interpret scripture with scripture. What happened in the book of Romans when the Roman governor, Festus, wanted to take Paul to Jerusalem, where he was going to be entrapped and killed? Paul says, no you don't, I killed Caesar. There's a Roman governor saying, this is what I want to do, and Paul says no. And he says, if I've done something wrong, I do not hesitate to be killed. But if I have done nothing, no one has a right to hand me over to them. And that included the Roman governor. So did Paul say all governors are, all politicians are automatically right? Obviously not. Nadir wants to know, why did God change? Why did God change between the Old Testament and the New Testament? Well, I don't think God has changed. And uh, just to clarify what I mean here, think about the Quran. In the Quran, you can turn to one passage, and you'll see that God's command for those who commit sexual sin is house arrest. You turn to another passage, God's command for uh, those who commit sexual sin is 100 lashes. Did God change? Well, the situation changed, and the situations in the world have changed over and over again. I explained that God can have different covenants, and in the Bible, God certainly has different covenants with different people. But you see the same, similar teachings in the Old Testament that you find in the New Testament. For instance, Deuteronomy 10, 18 through 19, says that God defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow, and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. This is not us versus them. God loves the foreigners just as much as he loves the Jews. Nadir refers to 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable. Well, what does Paul mean here? All we have to do is read what Paul says, and he tells us. I will quote uh, 1 Corinthians 10, six, uh, starting at verse 6 where Paul is talking about God judging people in the Old Testament. He says, now these things happened as examples for us, so that we would not crave evil things as they also crave. The Apostle Paul looks at the Old Testament and he says, these things happen, they are examples for us, not to be idolaters, not to do the same evil things that these people did. Does Paul interpret this as, well, we're supposed to go and kill and slaughter people? No, he doesn't. And to pretend that he does, which would contradict everything Paul ever says, uh, is sheer, absolute misrepresentation. There are a few other issues. I'll try to respond to those in, uh, in the crossfire, but we can see we certainly have no reason to think that Christianity promotes violence towards non-Christians. yet, but, um, you know, like I said, I hope, you know, what you're saying is right, but it doesn't make sense. I mean, the verse where it says, if my kingdom was of this world, then my followers would fight so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. So this was a specific situation, which Jesus said was very clear, in this specific situation. And a lot of what David was mentioning just really wasn't coherent. You know, and I think that happens in a lot of debate when you don't have a good answer. You just kind of quibble, and and your your under you know your your explanations really aren't very clear. But he tried to give some explanation. Well, this is just the greatest situation to fight for Jesus. Okay, but still, remember, he only gave one situation here. So again, this goes back to his interpretation. He's got his own personal interpretation of Scripture that he wants to impose upon the text here. And that's fine, but actually my interpretation, which is actually the common sense here, also makes sense. That's in this specific instance, to hand over Jesus to the Jews, you are not supposed to fight. That was very clear from the text. And you seem to have also uh, misunderstood the issue of Romans. Romans, what I'm trying to show you here, there are exceptions to this rule of fighting. The, 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 whoever you want to believe these rulers are, you, let's, okay, let's go along with Sarah Powell. You guys want to believe in Sarah Palin. Okay, so if Sarah Palin over here uses a sword, she's doing God's work. That's very clear from the text. In fact, let me, let me read this to you again here. 
just so that uh, you know we don't under you don't misunderstand it over here. For he is a minister, or he, or we'll say she. For she is a minister of God for uh, to thee for good. But if thou that which doeth evil be afraid, for he bears not the sword in vain. For he is a minister of God. So to do violence. In this situation, you are a minister of God. And so what I'm trying to show you is, yes, Christians can do violence in the name of Jesus. That's, that's very clear. The issue he was talking about, I asked, well, obviously there's exceptions to the, war, to the rule. I mean, do you guys love Satan? Of course, you're going to say no. His explanation was incoherent. I'm not even going to bother to respond to it. So you need to have to come up and clarify, what did you mean? You know, I work very hard to speak clearly. You know, I kind of speak slow. And I think what you're going to notice when you don't have a good answer, your opponent's going to talk very fast, and he's going to sound like he's responding, but he's really not. So I would ask for you to come back up here and explain what exactly you mean over here. The thing about it, you try to say, um, you know, the parable ends at verse 26. That interpretation doesn't work because the enemies have no, de have no definition. Well, sure they do. For the people who don't accept Jesus, you know, they are the Antichrist. Like, you remember you were telling us uh, last night, and I, and I think Sam Shalom mentioned the same thing, because Muhammad said, uh, you know, he denied the cross, denied essential Christian teachings. He is the Antichrist. That's clear from the New Testament, right, guys? Yeah, of course it is. So actually, Jesus has many enemies over here. And then also I'm showing you, Jesus is showing you in this parable how to grow that money by implementing Luke 19.27. This is how you make that profit that Jesus is going to be looking for in his second coming. He's showing you how to grow the money. Because obviously the ruler here is referring to Jesus and his second coming. And he's going to be looking for money. I still haven't heard an explanation why that interpretation is wrong. And then he said, uh, Matthew chapter 23, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 10, verse 13, is just talking about the greeting, shalom. Inside Arabic, we say salam. And my question to you is, did you look up this verse when Jesus says, and let your peace return back to you? The word there is not shalom. I actually looked it up. It's Irene. The word is Irene, not shalom. Okay, and let me give you the example of what Irene means. Oh, let me tell you what exactly the, um, the definition for Irene. It says over, and, um, I'm just going to read it to you real quick. Irene, yes, yes, the definition. A state of national tranquility, exemption from the rage and havoc of war. That's what that word is referring to. Exemption from the rage and havoc of war. It's not talking about shalom. So once again, I will repeat my question. Let your peace return back to you. Does this mean to continue to be peaceful with them? Let your irony return back to you, which is exemption from rage and havoc of war. Now, I want you to tell me how this means, continue to be peaceful with them. So what we're seeing here, that there are exceptions to the rules of this peacefulness, which um, which David Wood is telling us. He still didn't explain to us, you know, about uh, two, uh, 2 Chronicles, chapter 15, verse 12. Remember, that's a clear, and I believe he agrees with me, it's a clear text that those who do not seek Jesus were, were put to death. That was a very clear text. He says, we're not under the covenant. Again, I'll repeat to you. Two Chronicles has nothing to do with covenants. It has nothing to do with law. It's about pleasing God. Making a pledge to please God. And that's what they did. And thus God became happy. He tried to pull a, bring in the Quran how the laws of the Quran changes. Right, laws can change, no problem, due to the situation. But the nature of God does not change. It is from the attributes of God that when you kill people in His name, it makes Him happy happy. Okay, and that's, I think it's very clear from the text. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, once again, I put my fingers off my keyboard. He is not coherent. The text is very clear, and, I, and you'll have to come back up and, and please be very clear on what your explanation is. You know, I'm very clear. I, I mean, I hope, at least I try very hard. I actually talk in the mirror and to make sure that my communication skills are very good here. you got to speak clearly on what we mean. The text says, 
All scripture, not some, all scripture referring to everything inside the Old Testament is profitable for you and has got to fit in one of those four categories. Once again, I will repeat my question to him. Which one of these four categories does wrestling down little kids, brandishing a knife in them, and say, do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? That is what the text says. And killing them if they don't. My question is, which one of these four categories does it fit in? And I'll be looking forward to hear from his response, because the first one wasn't intelligible. The whole thing about, well, the greatest situation, you know, to save Jesus, you know, that doesn't make sense either. I think my interpretations make sense. He really didn't show anywhere that we are not supposed to fight in the name of Jesus. But it's very important here. Fighting against Adolf Hitler. You've got to take a position on this. Does God want you to fight against Adolf Hitler? That's just a yes or no question. Or you could say it's indifferent. I don't care. No, come on. We all agree, dude. God wants you to fight against Adolf Hitler. Yes, he does. All right? But what's very interesting here tonight we don't find the golden rule in Christianity, which we find in the Quran. Fight for those people who are oppressed. We don't find that there. Because the book of misguidance will either misguide you in this direction Thank you. or in that one. Well, I'll respond briefly to Yadir's uh, interpretation of Matthew and the greeting of peace. He says, well, it's not shalom, it's irene. That's true. That's because Irene is the Greek translation of Shalom. I'll give you an example. In Galatians 1.3, Paul greets them with Kares humin kai Irene. What's that mean? Paul combines the Greek greeting and the Jewish greeting. The Greeks greeted with Kares, or grace, and the Jews greeted with Shalom. Paul combines them. So when, uh, when uh, we read in Matthew, let your Irene, that's simply the Greek translation of uh, shalom. So it's letting your greeting return to you. Nadir says he doesn't understand my explanation of Matthew 5. Let's uh, review it. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. What's he talking about when he says enemies? It's people upon whom he sends his son and, uh, and rain. This obviously refers to human beings. Uh, again, I don't know the status of how we're to think of Satan, uh, but obviously human beings are being referred to in this passage. He says, Romans 13, there are exceptions to the rule about fighting. Of course there are exceptions. I, I never said no, no one is allowed to ever fight. Romans 13 does say that God institutes governments for this purpose. The sort of fighting we're talking about in the context of this debate is fighting unbelievers because they're unbelievers. When people fight Hitler, when the government fights Hitler, it's not because he's an unbeliever. It's not, aha, Hitler wasn't a good Christian, therefore we have to go out and fight him. It's because Hitler is doing some really, really bad things, and who fights them? The government does. Um, Luke 19.27, the deer says, again, we can just hack that off at the end, and Jesus obviously says you have enemies, so when he says, those enemies of mine, bring them here, he's obviously referring to uh, his own enemies. That's absolute nonsense. When you say, those enemies of mine, what enemies in context? Makes no sense if you chop the, la the, chop the last verse of the story off. And again, did Jesus' followers say, oh, he just commanded us to go fight and kill? No, they know it's part of the story. Anyone who reads it knows it's part of the story. The only people in the universe who would ever say that's not part of this parable are people who have nowhere else to go in trying to show that Christianity is as violent as Islam. And you can compare that with Surah 929, fight those who believe not in Allah. What did Muhammad do? What was Muhammad's reaction? He went out and fought. His interpretation, he knew what that meant. He went out and fought. What happens when uh, Jesus' followers are given this verse? They don't do anything because they know it's part of the parable Jesus was telling. So, uh, I, I don't know what to think about this debate. Yesterday we saw that according to Nadir, Allah has some weird speech disability where he can't say what he means. And I'm wondering if he believes that Jesus and the apostles have the same disability. But here it's reversed. They want to say, fight and subjugate your enemies, but it comes out, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. When he really means fight and kill. So, whether we turn to Allah and Muhammad, or whether we turn to Jesus and the apostles, everyone seems 
to always say the opposite of what they mean. Strange, uh, strange view of language. Okay, so uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration to God. Did he tell us? Did he answer us? Where does this fit in? Brandishing little knife, a knife, that little kid. Think, do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Where does this fit in? It has to be. It says all scripture is given by inspiration to God. Argument number two, and I don't think he's answered, it is from the attributes of from the nature of God that when you kill in His name, when you say that, will you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior? God became fawn. 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 15. It makes God happy. It's from His attributes. That never changes. Laws, covenants, stuff like that changes. No problem. Okay, the whole issue of Irene, you know, and again, when you look at the definition over there, you know, the definition I gave you actually is true, but it doesn't matter. We have the same word in Arabic. When we say salam or shalom, it means peace be on you. We want peace to be with you. The issue here, whatever word here is being used is not important. The important part here is that peace you bring back. Okay, so, and that's why even when you see even Prophet Muhammad sallallahu he would not greet his enemies with salam wa alaykum. You would not say salam to them. Because they understand. The words have meaning. You are supposed to bring your peace back to you. So my explain, my understanding of that verse, he still hasn't shown the error. Matthew chapter 10, verse 15, again, shows another exception to the rule. That when they do not accept Jesus, or when they do not receive the message, you are to take your peace back from them. And then the next verse says, then you, when you depart from that place, or that town or city, then you wipe the dust off your feet. I still don't know, I still don't know why this explanation is wrong. Okay? The Luke mandate. Luke chapter 19, verse 27. Is he antichrist an enemy? Yeah. First John tells us that those people who deny the Christ, they are the antichrist. There you go, that makes sense. So it does make sense. It, the explanations I'm giving you does make sense. And even the explanations David would give you to a certain extent make sense. But that's my point tonight. That the, what I'm telling you, it is a legitimate, valid explanation of the Bible. So we hope we can, you know, David can come forward and, uh, and tell us how could God's nature change? It made God happy when they made this promise. They were seeking to please God, and they didn't. Inside 2 Chronicles, chapter 15, verses, chapter 12, verse 15, or chapter 15, verses 12 through 15. There you go. Sorry about that. Thank you. Nadir keeps saying that Second Chronicles uh, shows people brandishing knives at children saying, except the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, that would be a bit of an interpolation. Uh, but where does it say that God rejoiced over any killing? Um, I've got it right in front of me. I, I don't see it, that God rejoiced over killing. God rejoiced because they had chosen to seek Him, to seek His will in following Him. But where is the part about God rejoicing over killing Him? Uh, I don't see it. Maybe Nadir can uh, uh, show it in a different translation. <laughs> Nadir says that when, it, when Jesus says, you bring back your peace, obviously this means that you're now hostile to them. That would be fine if you didn't keep reading the passage when Jesus says, okay, then you leave and let God judge them. So think about this. In Islam... Allah commands, fight those who do not believe in Allah. What's that mean, Nadir? It means something totally different. What's it mean when Jesus says, if they don't accept, accept your message, you leave and wait for God to judge them? It obviously means you fight them. Wow. Um, 1927, Nadir keeps saying, in Luke, he keeps saying, well, Jesus has enemies, therefore, 
That's what it means. No, no, no. Read it in context. The verse says, those enemies of mine. When you say those enemies of mine, you're referring to someone you're just talking about. The only person talking in that context is this king who went on a journey. So if you say those, that's a pronoun. You're talking about someone you've just been talking about. It would make no sense for Jesus to say those enemies of mine, when in context, the only enemies referred to are people in a story. And that's why the apostles did not go out and fight and kill anyone. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. I've already pointed out 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 6 through 10. We could add 2 Peter 4, uh, 2, 4 through 8, Jude 5 through 7. These all refer to God's judgments in the Old Testament and tell us, don't do the same things they did. Nowhere in here is, is this telling you, therefore you go out and obey every command in the Old Testament. According to Nadir, again, Build me an ark. Well, that means you go out and build an ark. No, it doesn't. No one would ever interpret it that way unless they were absolutely desperate to try and show some kind of violence in the Bible to make it sound uh, as violent as the Quran. Okay. Um, you know... The issue of Islam has already been debated, and we've already seen inside the debate on Islam that uh, the violent passages actually came to confront a clear and present danger. And I do ask you to please watch that debate, and you'll see that he was actually not able to respond to them. Islam taught to fight on behalf of disbelievers, uh, and we also saw to wage war on their behalf. So there's many reasons why they were called to fight, uh, but that debate's over. You know, the whole issue about 2 Timothy 3.16, I'm not going to respond because he's not coherent. He, and I'm, just, I'm trying to type here. You said something. They, uh, let's see, you said something like they were ordered not to do something or another. He's not coherent. The text is very clear. Okay, he doesn't have an answer, so he's just quibbling. Okay? He says, all scripture is given by inspiration unto God for doctrine, reproof, I'm sorry, and it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, corrections and the instruction of your righteousness. So everything you read in there is profitable for you. So that also means to Chronicles chapter 15 verses 12. And if you read that text over here, and in fact let me uh, read that for you because I think he was saying that um, where did he say, he asked uh, where did it say God rejoices? It says right there that they seek to please God, which is uh, first they said they made this pledge, okay? that we will kill anyone who does not accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That is what it says, right? I believe so. And then about two verses down, they sought to God eagerly. How did they seek God eagerly? With their pledge. They made this pledge to please God. And he was fond by them, so the Lord gave them rest on every side. So God became happy when they made this pledge. And 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all of this is profitable for you. Okay, um, I don't think he refuted my explanation that the enemies of Jesus is obviously what uh, first, uh, you know, and I am reading it within the context of the Bible here. He's, he wants me to define enemy over here. Well, I'm using 1 John. Why can't I do that? Why can't I use 1 John to define the enemy in which anyone who denies a Christ is the Antichrist? There's your enemy right there. Again, it goes back to what I'm saying. I mean, my explanation makes sense. He can come up with alternative explanations, that's fine too. But that doesn't prove what I'm saying is wrong. Okay, this issue about, you know, we're going back and forth on this, you know, Matthew chapter 10, verse 13. And my explanation over here, you are not to be peaceful with those who do not receive Jesus. And then the verse continues. And when you depart from that city, wipe the dust off your feet. I'm not sure how this somehow means continue to be peaceful with them. It doesn't make sense what he's saying. It doesn't add up. Second Timothy 3.16 All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Nadir's interpretation, therefore we are commanded to follow all the Old Testament commands. Anyone who would say that the Apostle Paul, read Galatians, read any of his writings, is saying that we are under the Old Covenant, 
I don't know what to think. I don't know what to think. But you can see Paul over and over and over again, uh, who responds to people who say we're the, under the old covenant, and say here he obviously means we're under the old covenant. Now think about this. What does Paul also say? 1 Timothy 5.18 For the scripture says you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing and the laborer is worthy of his wages. The laborer is worthy of his wages. What's the apostle Paul quoting there? He's quoting Luke 10.7 Stay in that house eating and drinking what they give you for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not keep moving from house to house. This is a parallel passage with the, with the uh, passage that Nadir is quoting. Notice how this passage that Paul is quoting reads but when you enter a town and are not welcome, this is the continuation, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town I wipe from our feet as a warning to you. It's a warning. Warning of what? That we're going to come back and kill? We're going to come back and slaughter you? Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. This is referring to future judgment, and you are giving a sign by withdrawing your peace and wiping the dust off your feet. You guys can expect future judgment. This is as clear as day, it's as clear as anything could possibly ever be in context, and yet our Muslim opponent says that's not what it means at all. Much like Allah when he says things, much like Muhammad when he says things, these people mean something totally different from what they actually say. Very interesting. Um, Nadir again doesn't seem to get the point, and I'm, I'm just going to say it for the last time here. He says, well, Jesus has enemies. I agree. Jesus has an enemy, the Antichrist. I agree. When Jesus says, those enemies of mine, that presupposes that you're talking about something already. When I say, those enemies of mine, what enemies of mine? The Antichrist of later books that haven't been written? No. The enemies referred to in the story, and again, this is just a parable. To say otherwise uh, is just desperation. Um, Nadir again says that Second Chronicles refers to God being glad. No, it says they sought the Lord. It does say that they put people to death who weren't following the Lord. That was part of the Old Covenant. You had been rescued from Egypt. God says, you're going to be in this land. You have to follow my law. But this says nothing, absolutely nothing, about God rejoicing and being happy over people being killed. It's just not in the text. And to say it is, is inventing things. Well, sure, it's in the text it's right there. 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 15. It says over here, in fact, I can read it to you at verbatim. Again, this is just two verses down, all right? And actually, I think he said, who are not following the Lord, who will not seek the Lord, I believe, is exactly the, the, the word over there. So basically, my explanation is exactly right. If they would not accept Jesus Christ, and again, that is Jesus Christ, right, as Lord and Savior, they would be put to death. And then the verse goes on to say, in fact, I want to make sure I read it to you. you know, um, let me look to find it over here. Oh, yes, here it is. They sought God eagerly. They sought God eagerly with their pledge. And he was fond by them. And he gave them, and the verse goes on, so the Lord gave them rest on every side. Okay? But there it is. He said he was, he was fond by them, which goes back to my point. When they made this pledge, this made Jesus very happy, or he made him fond with this pledge. And this is from the attributes of God. Okay? And God doesn't change in his attributes. Um, and then he said that to Timothy does not mean follow all the commands. I never said that. I said it from the very beginning. That's not what I'm saying here. I'm saying this is something you can benefit from. Benefit from the wisdom. Because 2 Timothy says, All scripture is given by inspiration unto God for doctrine, reproof, correction, and the verse goes on. So you're saying everything in there is very profitable. But now he's telling us that there's things in there which are not profitable. And that's exactly what I'm saying to you. There are things in the Bible which you will not profit from. So I'm glad you're agreeing with me tonight. Alhamdulillah. Everything in the Quran you can profit from. But even though that's not exactly what the what the Bible says, the Bible says exactly opposite. All of it is 
given by inspiration to God, but tonight we got it. See, he's saying tonight, there are things in this book that you cannot profit from. And that's exactly what I want to convey to you, because I told you from the beginning, it is a book of misguidance. And the main issue of misguidance, and this is really the most important for, uh, to me, the whole thing about killing in the name of Jesus, yeah, that's important, but to me, as a Muslim, the most important thing is missing the golden rule. And that you will find, true guidance, you will find in the Quran, chapter 4, verse 75. And what is wrong with you that you fight not in the cause of Allah? For those who are weak, oppressed, among men, women, children, and who hear them pray. How many more answers? Uh, one quick thing, we're not going to be collecting the questions you have from the speakers, so uh, we'll have uh, some people coming around to collect those. If they, so, uh, and that's it. Now we continue with the debate. Well, I think I finally figured out where Nadir was getting this idea that God was happy about killing. He keeps saying, and God was fond by them. Here, it's found by them. God was found by them. It says they sought God and he was found by them. Your entire argument is based on a typo. He says, I'm saying that things in the Bible are not profitable. No, I'm not. I'm saying if you understand anything at all about the Apostle Paul, it's crystal clear what he means. You look to Old Testament. You look to God's judgments. You look to the things God did. And you say, I don't want to do those same things. There's nothing in there about you carrying out the penalties. As Christians, you're, you're commanded not to carry out those same penalties. You're commanded not to do these sorts of things. And I gave the example of 1 Corinthians 10, um, where Paul says, now let these things, now these things happen as examples for us so that we would not crave evil things as they also crave. What's he saying? Don't do what those people did. He's looking to the Old Testament, seeing how God judged them and saying, let's not do the same thing. Was all of that profitable? Yes. And he's saying we can learn from it and we can profit from it. Was it profitable? Yes. Does that mean you go out and do the same thing or you carry out the judgment that God carries out? No. And just to give you another example, 2 Peter 2, 4 through 8. Let's read. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, and if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them as an example of those who would leave ungodly lives thereafter, and if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, what? We can learn from that. That's what, the, that's what Peter says, that's what Paul says. This is not hard to understand. It doesn't get any easier than this. And somehow, Nadir just cannot grasp it. Why? Of course, Nadir is intelligent enough to, to grasp all of this. But if you're a Muslim and you're in the position of trying to defend teachings like fight those who do not believe in Allah, and you need Christianity to sound violent so that Islam doesn't look so bad by comparison, you need violent teachings. And so what do you do? You go to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you? No. You go to the weapons of our war, war, we do not war against the we do not war against the flesh? No, of course not. You go to live in peace with all men? Of course not. You have to go, well, let me twist 2 Timothy 3.16 to make it sound as if you're commanded to commit violence, going against everything you read over and over and over again in your scriptures. Sheer, utter desperation. Yeah, as I said, it's clear tonight that the Bible doesn't have the golden rule. Either you, either God wants you to fight against people like Pol Pot and Hitler, either God wants you to, or he doesn't want you to do so, or he's indifferent. Islam gives the right answer. The Bible, unfortunately, gives a wrong answer. It will either misguide you into being at peace with all men, including Adolf Hitler and these people, or it will misguide you into the other direction, where you will kill anybody who does not seek the Lord. See, the whole thing about the fawn, if you understood my argument, David, the issue here with 
2 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 15. The Lord gave them rest. He became fond by them. The issue of well, the argument which I'm mentioning, God became happy. How many times do I have to repeat that? He didn't say, oh, wait a second. How could you make such a stupid pledge like that? God became pleased with this. This is from his nature. This is from his attributes. Therefore, your whole case is basically refuted on this point. He keeps going back to the Quran because he cannot, and it's the only way he can defend you know, the teachings of his own book. Here's the, the Quran debate is over. You were refuted on this. Remember, we showed from the Quran that if the disbelievers seek peace, then we will absolutely accept peace and will make them partners in peace and war. You were ignorant of this hadith. I had to share that with you. And then finally you read it. So absolutely, Muslims can live in peace. But we are called to wage war for the golden rule. There's nothing like that in the Bible. That's why I'm a Muslim. You know, I told you from the very beginning, the most important point to me here is this golden rule. It's really not trying to show that, you know, Christianity is evil. And I hope I lose this debate on that point. But the most important point here, it's a book of misguidance. Think that you're serving God, but you are not. He's misleading you in doing that. And um, 2 Timothy 3.16, again, it doesn't make any sense. There's no point in trying to respond to a person who doesn't make any sense. You want to have your own interpretation? That's fine. It's clear. All scripture. But you see, he said, no, no, but there's not. It means all, but again, it doesn't mean all over here. No, he's just not making any sense. This is my point. If you talk to the Christian about their Bible, they're going to tell you there's a lot in there you cannot profit from. Don't follow these teachings. This is exactly what we, we as Muslims are saying. In the very beginning, what am I telling you? It's a book of misguidance. Because if you start following these teachings, then you're going to do exactly what the Christians did all throughout history. Alhamdulillah, I can stand here firmly. Every ayat of the Quran, including the abrogated ones, you can follow. You'll be guided right. You can't say that about the Bible. That's my point. The Bible doesn't have the golden rule. Here, we invented the golden rule. It's called the golden rule because of us. And it's, it's not Surah 475. It's do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I don't want people killing me, so I don't go out killing. I don't go around persecuting people because I don't want them persecuting me. This is the golden rule. You keep referring to Surah 475, and if you read any of your commentaries on this verse, this is talking about Muslims being persecuted, and so you go to defend your fellow Muslims. Of course that's what the Quran commands. Then it tells you, later on, to go out and fight all unbelievers simply because they're unbelievers. You distort the meaning of the verses on fighting, and then you distort the meaning of 475, just as you're distorting the Bible in a desperate attempt to sort of level the playing ground. Uh, again, you keep referring to the word fond by them. It's found by them. In fact, let me go ahead and read the passage. This is, this is the Old Covenant. No one was put to death for not, uh, for not uh, making a public profession of faith in Jesus. Who were these people? These were people who had entered into a covenant with God. If they did not want to be in a covenant to live in God's land, they were free to leave. But they were in the land, and they started worshiping other gods. And under that particular covenant, that was a death penalty. So, yes, they were put to death. Now we're under a new covenant. We can look at that as profitable. We can look at that as profitable. But over and over again in the Bible, God is not pleased with killing and destruction. He wants repentance. And that's the only thing that pleases God, is that the people did turn back to them and honor their covenant. God does not rejoice in death and bloodshed. So, what we have here, over and over again, is again, everyone who speaks means the exact opposite of what they speak. Allah says, fight those who do not believe. He means, go out and promote peace somehow. Muhammad says, I've been commanded to fight people until they say, La Allah, illallah, there's no God but Allah. He really means, let's be partners in peace, according to Nadir. Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. He means go out and fight and slay and kill his enemies. His, his followers just didn't understand it. But then they go on. 
to promote violence and bloodshed in the rest of the New Testament by telling people to live in peace with all people, to love everyone, saying the exact opposite of what they mean. I feel like I'm debating an opposite world right now, the Zorro world, where up is down and down is up, left is right and right is left, and peace is violence and violence is peace. But I hope by the end of this debate we'll all take a quick trip to planet reality. <laughs> you know, there's no need to get uh, to get upset, David. <laughs> no. As I said tonight, you know, you know, I want to be as sympathetic to what you're to what you're saying. It's really not my intention. I told you from the beginning to really slam the Bible, and I've always I always mentioned this in my debate. In fact, in my last debate was uh, or with um, uh, Dr. James White, I gave him more time to speak. Now he keeps going back to the golden rule. You're right. The golden rule. I'm redefining it to chapter four, verse seventy-five. This is my point. The golden rule, do unto others as you would have to, you know, yes, that is the golden rule, but I'm redefining it as chapter 4, verse 75. And he said tonight that chapter 4, verse 75, it's only talking about Muslims, and there was some commentary. Again, he was refuted on, first of all, commentaries are not evidence in Islam, okay? And he was refuted, and now he's recycling the same bogus argument, but what commentary? Who made this commentary? I'm going to challenge him tonight to show me that commentary which says that. Okay, and, I'm, and I'll tell you what, if I don't know something, I'm going to come out and say, I don't know what that is. You know, if I don't understand something up here, I don't pretend to understand. Like, for example, what he's talking about, about 2 Timothy 3.16? I don't know what he's talking about. My explanation makes sense. People understand what I'm talking about. All scripture means everything. The whole thing about found it, you're missing the point, David. The issue here from chapter 12, from, chap from this verse over here, 2 Chronicles, God became happy. He became pleased with his pledge. That's the point. And I've been continually to say this over and over again. It's from his attributes. But the important point here tonight is he's just playing his words. The golden rule. Listen, either God wants you to fight against Adolf Hitler and Pol Pot, or he doesn't. It's or, or he's indifferent, eh, I don't care. Either one. You see, my point again here, and he's, I don't know, maybe he's trying to find someone, I hope he can try to find some scripture so I can take my comments back. I can say, no, I'm sorry, Dave, I was wrong about that. This is a book of misguidance. If you listen to what he's saying, it's a real complicated explanation of, there's some parts you got to follow here. If you follow these parts of the Bible, no, you're not supposed to. And this is exactly what my point is. I think we're just going back and forth. This is a book of misguidance. If there's so much of the Bible, which the Christians will warn you, no, no, don't follow that. Don't implement that. Don't benefit from that. Even though that contradicts 2 Timothy 3.16. And the law book, though, you can follow everything of the Quran. Remember how the uh, companions understood the chapter 4, verse 75. We will wage war on any enemy of theirs referring to the non-believers. Okay? And we will fight to secure their safety. Thank you.